today on Day of Discovery, In His Footsteps with Jim Cantillon. These images become the images that he reflects on and thinks about the character of God as Father and God's relationship to people so that when he steps out to teach, he's not quoting an authority. He's talking about real life in images that immediately capture his audience. He speaks the language of the people, not the language of the academy. Hi, I'm Jim Catalan. Welcome to In His Footsteps with Day of Discovery. Have you ever wondered what Jesus' early life was like? I certainly have. And because there's so little information out there, it's even more of a mystery. So what should we do? Well, how about doing what we're doing? We're right here in Nazareth, Nazareth Village, and we're going to inquire from the scriptures and also from my good friend, Dr. Claire Fawn. Uh, what was going on in Jesus' early development? So. This is something that is going to be intriguing. Uh, it's going to be informative. It's going to be interesting and fun. So right after this, I'll come back with the Bible. You know, we don't have a lot about Jesus' early life. Uh, there have been some attempts by various uh, Gnostic writers in history past kind of fabricating stories about Jesus, many of them with sensational, miraculous acts of his, you know, when he was eight, and nine, and ten years of age. But none of that is trustworthy. It's certainly not historical, and the Bible spends no time talking about the early life of Jesus. And so in some ways, we have to make some uh, general assumptions. For instance, Joseph, you know, his, uh, his father was a carpenter. And we know that Jesus trained in carpentry. In fact, there's a very interesting tradition that he may have specialized in making yokes. Remember that time when he says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light? There's a special skill to making yokes. He may have made them right here in uh, this, well, not this actual replica of Nazareth village, but right here in Nazareth. But we do have a passage in uh, Luke chapter 2 that talks about his early life at age 12. I want to uh, read uh, some of it to you, beginning with verse 41 of Luke 2. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his, and his mother did not know it, but supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they didn't find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Imagine their panic. Now, so it was that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Didn't you know I must be about my father's business? But they didn't understand the statement which he spoke to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth, where we are standing right now, and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. All right, that's the scripture. And if there's anything that's important about this Day of Discovery program, it's the scripture. You know, uh, you can't miss that. First of all, Joseph and Mary take Jesus to Passover. Now, why would they do that? It was because he had now become or was in the process of becoming a man at age 12. The scripture required attendance at three annual festivals every year for males. Jesus is now being seen as a young adult male, even though in our view, he's just still a child. But in Exodus chapter 23, you can read about that. And there were three uh, festivals that males in Israel were required to attend. One, Passover, which of course in Israel is called Pesach, but it celebrates Passover, Exodus, the time when God really identified, as he says in Hosea, with Israel as their God. The second one was Pentecost, or weeks, which occurred 50 days after Passover. It had a, fest, uh, a harvest festival aspect to it because it was the festival of first fruits, but it was seven weeks after Passover. And then the third was the Feast of Tabernacles, which essentially was a harvest feast. So those three 
every male Jew was required to attend the temple. Passover, of course, was a major event. Um, do you know that even though Jerusalem's uh, general population was about 25,000, 60 to 100,000 people would come into Jerusalem for Passover. I mean, it was unbelievable. Uh, the, and, and, and they would travel sometimes 10, 12 days to get to Jerusalem. On their way up to Jerusalem, and you always have to go up to Jerusalem, they would probably sing some of what are known as the Psalms of Ascent. For instance, uh, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, mountain of his holiness, beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion and the sides of the north, the city of the great king. They would sing it over and over again. And there were other Psalms of Ascent they would sing as they walked up to Jerusalem. So they would swell into the city. They would desperately find places to stay because they would stay there for a few days. They would travel in groups. Why? Safety. There were thieves, man. They were robbers all the time. And some of them, as, as I say, would take 10 to 12 days to get there. So Jesus is 12 years of age. He's becoming a young man. And you can expect that Joseph and Mary gave him a lot of independence. So quite likely, as they traveled in a group from Nazareth to Jerusalem, they wouldn't see Jesus all day. In fact, maybe they wouldn't see me even at night because he was probably tenting with some of his teenage friends. Why not? That's what teenagers do, right? So they come to Jerusalem. They go through the Passover uh, celebration, and they start coming back here to Nazareth. They're gone a day. Well, they hadn't been paying attention to where Jesus was on their way down. Why should they do it on the way back? He's a young guy. He's with his friends. You know, we'll see him when we see him. On the way down, he didn't spend the nights with us. He was with his friends. Same thing on the way back. But they notice after a day that he's not around. And so they ask, and you can imagine their desperation, can't find him. So they realize they've got to go back. Now, they've always traveled a day, so they've got to travel a day back. And then they take a day trying to find him, all in all, three days. I mean, this was urgent. And uh, they finally find him in the temple. Now, that means probably in one of the halls of its outer courts. Um, and there he is sitting with, you know, the PhDs of Jerusalem, with uh, the brilliant Sadducean priestly caste. And uh, he's interacting with them on the scriptures. Well, this was an amazement to these older guys. This little 12-year-old knows the scriptures in a way that we don't know the scripture. He has insights that haven't even occurred to us. And they were absolutely fascinated with this young man. And so they kept him there interacting with him. And it's interesting that when Joseph and Mary finally catch up to him, and Mary does her best to scold him, you know, and, you know, it's a gentle scold, uh, you know, uh, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. You can be sure it was a scold. He says, look, why are you even looking for me? Didn't you know that I must be about my father's business? Where did that come from? Obviously, in Jesus' early life, he had a profound sense of his divine calling. The Lord, no doubt, knew exactly what he was about. And even though, you know, he became like us and he went through the whole process of being born and, 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 and growing and being taught and trained and disciplined and so on, he had this profound sense of his destiny. And so he says, I'm doing my father's business. It's the first time, by the way, that Jesus refers to God as his father. There's, and there's many, many more times when he will do that. So after that little repartee, he says goodbye to the scholars and kind of maybe a little bit humbled by this, he walks off with his parents to try to catch up to their friends on their way here to Nazareth. And it's interesting what um, Luke says. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. What does that mean? He kept learning. He kept his brain in gear. He was engaged in thought with the uh, Tanakh, as they, as they call it, the, what we call the Old Testament. Secondly, uh, he continued to grow. You know, at 12 years of age, he wasn't as big as he would be at 30. So he continued to grow, which means his mother continued to feed him copious amounts of food. His father, Joseph, continued to train him in carpentry, uh, and he submitted himself to, to those disciplines. And he also grew in favor with God. So his relationship with his father just kept growing and growing and growing. And his friends, his neighbors, 
The people here in Nazareth, they liked this kid. He grew in favor with them too, all right? So wisdom, stature, favor with God and man, physically, mentally, spiritually, socially. The young boy Jesus grew up to be what we now know as the Savior of the world. And now we return to In His Footsteps with Jim Cantillon on Day of Discovery. It is late afternoon. I'm sitting here in the city of Jerusalem, a couple hundred meters from the Western Wall. There's been a lot of action here during the course of this day and a lot of heat, and there still may be more. Who knows as this interview uh, proceeds. But I'm happy to be here, especially with uh, Claire Fon, Professor Claire Fon from the uh, University of the Holy Land, who used to work with me years ago when I was planting and pastoring Camp Kings in Jerusalem. So uh, it's like sitting with a friend, with Claire, but she's a professor of New Testament at the uh, University of the Holy Land and is uh, uh, terrific. I always enjoy talking Thank with you, you, Claire. The feeling is mutual. <laughs> A lot of silence with regard to Jesus' early life. Um, what, what do we know at this point? Yes, well, we have just a few hints of things that we can ascertain from the Gospels. First of all, he grows up in a Jewish family that's very observant mm. because um, they circumcise him on the eighth day and announce his name at the circumcision. And you and Kathy know that that's yeah. exactly the same practice today that's right. as reflected in the scripture. And then there's a big circumcision party. They pay the redemption price of the firstborn. Mary makes a purification offering. And then, and then we jump 12 years later to the time that the family goes up to Jerusalem at the Passover, which was their custom. Mm. So we see them keeping the pilgrimage feasts. They were a Jewish family who's whose faith and practice had deep meaning for them. Do you think that um, he would have had any kind of uh, religious training? Uh, would that be part and parcel of just the typical education? Yes, in fact, we know that Queen Salome Alexandra, yeah. who was one of the Hasmonean queens. Right. The Hasmoneans are the descendants of the Maccabees. Right. She had a brother who was a famous rabbi. His name was Shimon ben Shetach, and he got her to cooperate in mandating compulsory education. So this meant that boys would begin to learn to read around the age of five, and they would continue until about the age of 12. Um, their textbook, How Would You Learn to Read? They would use the scrolls that were used for reading scripture in the synagogue. So their textbook was to learn to read from the Bible itself. Mm -hmm. and, and the functionality of this wasn't so that they would all become scribes, which is a completely different skill set, and or writing is a different skill, but it was so that they could participate in the synagogue service. And we know, of course, that Jesus did learn to read because yeah. in his proclamation in the synagogue in Luke 4, he picks up the scroll of Isaiah, which is the prophet's portion, the Haftarah of that day, and reads from the prophet Isaiah. So definitely he learned to read. Um, at the age of 12, usually a boy would stop his formal education and he would learn whatever his trade would be, whether he was going to be a tinsmith or a builder or a shepherd or a merchant. He would focus then on becoming an apprentice to his mentor or his father. And that's why the story that is told in Luke chapter 2 is so riveting. Jesus goes up at 12. He is at the temple. Of course, we know the parents head home. They have no sign of Jesus for a whole day. They wait till the next morning to walk back to Jerusalem. It takes them a whole year, a whole day to get there. And then they have to find him in this city, which is very impossible. He's at the Temple Mount and he is talking to the rabbis and the teachers of the law. And it's, uh, it's a mutual admiration society. Mm. They love the kid. He's so bright, his questions are great, his answers are great. He loves them. This is very stimulating, wonderful environment. It's not the first time that he's been there. His parents went up there regularly, but something happened to him at 12 that was like a light bulb going on. Because he, he said, when Mary walks in and says, you know, how could you do this to your father and me? Don't you know we thought you were lying dead in a ditch? Now yeah. you're grounded for life. Yeah. No, that's what yeah. she thought. But yeah. she just said, how could you do this to your father and me? He answers her with that kind of aplomb that only a 12 to 13 year old boy has. You know, mother, yeah. didn't you, don't you understand it? Where do you think I would be? Don't you understand that I need to be in the, of my father? And there's not even a noun in the Greek. It doesn't say house, it doesn't say business, it doesn't say affairs. It says the, 
of my father, as though that is a milieu. Uh. It is a an atmosphere in which he belongs and that the temple will be his destination. But Mary puts her foot down and says, no, honey, you know, we know you're a very special child, but you're gonna come home with us to Nazareth because raising him is the responsibility of Mary and Joseph. And she's not gonna entrust him to the temple. This story tells us that at 12, the religious authorities recognized Jesus' talent and ability. He should have gone to an academy, but he didn't. Right. And it also tells us that when people say, where did he get this teaching? He's one who teaches with authority, not like all of the others. They recognize that he never had a seminary training and yeah. no ordination. But Luke tells us, well, he could have done it. It just wasn't God's purposes for him. Yeah, and, and I think, uh, as I understand it, even today in modern uh, academic work, uh, it's really, really important to quote your sources, to quote the authorities uh, from whom you have learned this and learned that, who made this statement, made that statement. Jesus didn't quote anybody. He didn't quote anybody. He quoted scripture, and then he actually used as his material what he learned in his childhood and youth. Yeah. Because Nazareth became his classroom, yeah. what did he see? He saw how farmers sowed seed in the field, and he observed how the birds ate some, how others withered up, and how the ones that were watered grew. And he watched shepherds with their sheep and their goats and the process of separating sheep from goats and the dependency of sheep and the wildness of goats. And he saw parents with their children and how dysfunction could creep into a family and how you could have rebellion and you could have pride existing in siblings and, and how forgiveness covers it. And these images become the images that he reflects on and thinks about the character of God as Father and God's relationship to people so that when he steps out to teach, he's not quoting an authority. He's talking about real life in images that immediately capture his audience. He speaks the language of the people, not the language of the academy. You know, um, when we read about his uh, friendship with Lazarus and mm -hmm. Mary and Martha, mm -hmm. I know they were close to where we're sitting here, mm -hmm. just over the hill there on the other mm -hmm. side of the Mount of Olives in Bethany. But I've often wondered, um, how did they get to know each other? We have no, we can only speculate, but what it tells me is that Jesus had social relationships. In fact, Luke 2 and 52 says, and Jesus increased in wisdom, mentally, mm -hmm. stature, physically, favor with God, spiritually, and men, socially. Mm -hmm. So he had friends. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, <sighs> When I read Luke 2 and 52, and I see physical, mental, spiritual, social development, the mystery to me is the spiritual development. Mm -hmm. What did he know about himself as a young boy? And I know there's a lot of uh, speculation, Gnostic Gospels written about, you know, miracles he performed with little birds and you know, you know, other kinds of things. Uh, what's your sense of what he knew about himself? Yes, well, we have so few clues. Yeah. The only story that even addresses it is Luke chapter 2. Right. That he understood that he had a unique calling. Yeah. Um, how that calling would be expressed, I think, gets played out in his ministry because we see that he understands the heart of man. He's got tremendous discernment, tremendous emotional intelligence, and a prophetic insight into people. But he doesn't know every step of how his own messianic identity will be played out. He has to go away to the mountaintop to pray. He has to get away with God to guide him on how to handle a ministry that is growing with demands that are so pressing. He doesn't have time to sleep. He doesn't have time to eat. He prays and then he'll come down and he'll take action. He will appoint 12 to be a core inner group of disciples. He, he gets tired. We see this with the Syrophoenician woman. But even in that moment of human weariness, when she says to him, please heal my daughter, and he says, it's not right to give the children's bread to the dogs. She says, okay, I'm willing to be a dog. But she says, even the dogs get the crumbs. Yeah. And he, in, in Mark, he says, you can go your way. Your daughter is healed because of this saying. Now the word is logos. It's not because of your faith, but it's because of some insight this woman had about Jesus. And what is that insight? She's saying, Jesus, 
If you are the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, then shouldn't you, shouldn't your ministry, shouldn't your identity have some impact also for the Gentiles? Even if it's just a crumb, it's a small thing for you, but the ripple effect, what about the promise to Abraham? And that is a turning point in Jesus's ministry. From there, he goes back to the Galilee. He goes to the Decapolis, which is the area of the Gentiles. He, he, he heals a Gentile man who is deaf and mute. He feeds 4,000 Gentiles with bread. Yeah. And he then starts to teach on the fact that in order for him to really be the Messiah, he will have to suffer and die and rise again. So we see these little moments of of a shifting and broadening perspective and things that might have acted as catalysts as he prays and as he encounters people to broaden his understanding of what kind of Messiah he really is. Uh, we're not theologians here on this show, but in uh, Philippians 2, yeah. when Paul tries to describe what Jesus did in taking on flesh and dwelling among us, I think the Greek word there is called kenosis, which refers to emptying. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I don't know if I fully understand what I'm saying now, but when I say it, it's something I've learned, that Jesus emptied himself of the independent exercise of his godlike attributes in order to become flesh, which means that he did live with certain self-imposed, but certain limitations. Yes. Which then leads credence to me, as I read it anyway, to those who say, when he was baptized by John in the River Jordan, and the Spirit of the Lord descended on him like a dove. And he heard this voice saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, that this came as affirmation, if not revelation, yes. to Jesus. Yes. And it would do so if indeed he was living in this uh, self-imposed emptying. Yes, I, I agree 100%. And that's what the temptations are about. Yeah. The baptism is this affirmation. You are really special and chosen in a way unlike any other. You are the Son of God. And then every temptation begins if you are the Son of God. If you are, right. And what kind of Messiah are you going to be, Jesus? Are you going to be one who uses your power for self-gratification? Are you going to be one who uses your power for self-adulation? Are you going to be one who uses your identity just to have power and wealth? And in, to each of these tests, Jesus responds by clarifying what it means to be the Son of God. He will not act without God's direction. Yeah. He will not act without God's direction. But that meant that he needed God to speak to him and to direct him. And, and the, the lesson of him being obedient to Mary and Joseph in chapter two of Luke, that obedience to his human parents be, is the pattern for obedience to his divine father so that when he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and the cross, he can do it because he has learned obedience and God has directed his understanding of what the Messiah needs to be. I would have loved to have been in the household when Joseph and Mary from time to time disciplined their, <laughs> their, uh, their son yes. and to have seen how he responded to that discipline. I mean, here you have, as John will tell us, the creator of all it is, uh, submitting himself to his earthly parents, emptying himself of so much that he didn't have to empty himself of, but he did it so that you and I and Claire and all of us could know eternal life. It's an amazing story, friends. Little wonder Jesus is so compelling. Okay, we're going to take a little break here, and uh, after the break, I'll conclude uh, the half hour. So you stay with us. I'll be back right after this. And now we return to In His Footsteps with Jim Cantillon on Day of Discovery. I just have a further thought about that last sentence in Luke 2 and 52, where it says, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Mentally, physically, spiritually, and socially, Jesus developed. You know what I see there? I see balance. You know, sometimes we over-spiritualize Jesus, let alone over-spiritualize our discipleship as followers of Jesus. We, we, we fail to recognize that, you know, he had to sleep, he had to eat, he had to learn how to read, he had to submit himself to the discipline of his parents, uh, he had to socialize with his friends, uh, he had to explain himself from time to time when he was making decisions and or saying things that may have been provocative to some. Uh, he was a fully balanced 
human being. Let's never forget, Jesus was fully man, even while he was fully God. It's important for us to commit ourselves to a balanced life. Where there is physical development, yes. Mental, absolutely. Social, for sure, but spiritual as well. And if we can achieve that balance, then we're going to at least be following Jesus' example. Not saying we're gonna become little Jesuses, but certainly we'll be well on our way to not just balanced living, but to righteous living, good living, the kind of living that the scripture speaks well of. So keep that in mind as you think and study the life of Christ. I'm Jim Catalan. This is Dave Discovery in his footsteps. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again next time. Join us again next week at this same time for another Day of Discovery. Day of Discovery is a video outreach of Our Daily Bread Ministries Canada and is supported by the free will gifts of friends like you who enjoy these programs. For more information about Our Daily Bread Ministries Canada, please visit us online at ourdailybread.ca.